right, so welcome everyone. This is Danya Koja. This is Wendy Chang. And we are doing our first podcast for the critical decisions in emergency medicine. So if you're not familiar with this publication, Critical Decisions, or CDEM, is ASAP's official CME publication. And it's a fantastic publication that's out there. If you're not familiar with it, please run home and actually log in and take a look. What their issues typically do are they are divided into two lessons, and these lessons discuss topics that are familiar to us in the emergency department. Some are bread and butter, things like seizures, foot injuries, and things like that. And sometimes they're a little out there, a little cutting edge. And the great part about them is they're not review articles. They're not sitting there talking about the nitty gritty details of topics. It targets five to seven critical decisions that you have to make in the emergency department when you see these patients. Agreed. The topics cover the breadth of emergency medicine, really modeled after the EM model. And that's why a lot of residency programs have utilized this as part of their reading materials. It's also a great review for us in the clinical practice, especially when, depending on your clinical practice, maybe you don't see certain things, whether it's urgent care injuries or other clinical problems as much anymore. And the great thing about this is that if you're looking for a place to get some extra CME, you can actually get your CME from reading the articles and answering the questions. And on top of the two lessons that we talked about, you have a critical EKG. So there's an EKG and discussion of the critical finding in that, a critical radiograph and a critical procedure, which is really nice because there are some procedures out there that we don't do on a daily basis. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't do super pubic catheters on a regular basis. So this was a pretty good reminder in this particular issue for that. So if you have not checked out critical decisions, please go ahead and do so. And what we're doing in this podcast is discussing our take-home points and some bits and pieces of these lessons. However, it is absolutely not a comprehensive review of the lessons in the issue. If you find these topics interesting, then go on, log in, and take a look at the whole lesson. And if not, you know what? I'm pretty sure next issue, which is next month, is going to have something that's interesting to you. So let's go ahead and talk about this one. The first lesson in this issue is called Out of Step, which talks about sports-related foot injuries. And I don't know how you feel about this, Wendy, but one of my least favorite things to do in the emergency department is take care of foot complaints. It's absolutely nowhere near as enticing as critically ill patients. It's sometimes kind of gross. The problem is that I know with people with foot injuries, I'm going to have to read their x-ray, which is not one of my favorite things to do. I think that I'm probably a little bit out of touch in terms of foot-related injuries, so this particular article was a great review for me. And we have to thank Dr. Jeffrey Faden, as well as John Keel, for writing this particular article, as well as the many pearls that uh, we will review in just a little bit. So this article touches on the basic bread and butter things related to foot injuries. As you know, I work at a community hospital, as well as at the main medical center, so I have to read my x-rays. And I have no orthopedic surgeon that's available 24-7 to come and take a look at this foot injury or let me know what to do. Yikes. I got to make my decisions and figure it out during my nocturnal shifts at 2 in the morning. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun, independent practice. So what this article talks about, first of all, do you know how many bones you have in your foot, Wendy? Well, I was actually pleasantly surprised where maybe this is a reflection again of how much I needed this review. (laughs) Apparently we have 28 bones in the foot. I know. I was just like, huh, that's probably 20 more than I could name. (laughs) And I think one of the issues with foot x-rays and foot injuries is that there isn't a good mnemonic out there for when you're reading foot x-rays. And I googled some and they were pretty interesting. They were a little out there and I've never heard them before. So let's just skip that part. So you have 28 bones in your foot, and then your foot is divided to forefoot, midfoot, and hindfoot. And of course, you're not going to sit there and examine all of these bones, right? I mean, I'm not a podiatrist, so that's not going to happen. And one thing that's mentioned in the article is, which is an examination pearl, is there are three spots in the foot that you have to always examine. One is the base of the fifth metatarsal. The second is the medial aspect of the midfoot, which confused me for like five seconds, and I'll tell you why. And the Achilles tendon for Achilles tendon rupture. Now, the part about the medial aspect of the midfoot, I'm like, why is that important? I know the Jones fracture, right? I know Mm -hmm. the Achilles tendon rupture, so I'm like, yes, I'm two-thirds there. But the medial aspect for the midfoot is apparently where you miss your Lisfranc injuries. When was the last time you saw a Lisfranc injury, Wendy? 
That would be back in, unfortunately, residency when we had some major traumas. And so when I think of Liz Frank injuries, I definitely only think of, you know, high energy, high velocity type of mechanisms of injury. But again, this article surprised me because I learned that it can actually occur from low energy mechanisms too. Yep. I'm sitting here thinking about how many injuries have I missed that are Liz Frank injuries, which exactly, you're making a very unpleasant face right now, Wendy. I hear you. <laughs> So just as a reminder, so where the Lisfranc ligament is, it connects the medial side of the cuneiform and the base of the second metatarsal. And if you're a visual person, this makes no sense to you now that I'm talking about it. And the article actually has really great 3D pictures of these injuries for this and a bunch of other ones that make it a little easier to understand. So this Lisfranc ligament connects that base of the second metatarsal with the medial side of the cuneiform. And what sometimes happens is that there is an occult fracture there that you don't actually see on the x-ray. And you just have the ligamentous disruption. So one option is to either do an MRI, which is obviously not really Limited. realistic. Yeah. yeah. Let's just say I cannot do that at 2 a.m. <laughs> at your <early> shop. <laughs> the community hospital. And I really don't think that I can do it anywhere, really, at 2 in the morning and ask for an MRI. You can do a CT, but the point is you need to think about it. So you can either see the fracture, which obviously is going to be kind of obvious, or you can actually see a disruption in the lines. Apparently the foot has so many lines, it's beyond the scope of me talking about it. I probably have to Google it every time I see foot x-ray. There but are 28 <laughs> bones that make up a lot of lines. <laughs> That's very true. But then if you have that tenderness in the medial aspect of your midfoot and you have an injury pattern that would concern you for a less frank injury, then you can use a CT for that occult fracture or you can have the patient follow up the next day in a clinic if you have that setup available. If you don't think about it though, it's not going to happen. You're not going to suspect a Liz Frank injury. I think tenderness in the midfoot region is not uncommon. So again, when we have a high index of suspicion, we have to take the extra step and answer the question of, is there a Liz Frank injury of some sort? And like you mentioned, it may not be a fracture. It may be a ligamentous injury, but this would have significant morbidity for the patient in terms of their chronic pain and function of their foot. Another thing that I don't tend to think of a lot is a tarsal navicular fracture, and those can have minor avulsion injuries as well. And as we had said, and that's going to be like a repetitive pattern in a lot of these foot injuries that are occult, is if you can't find it on an x-ray and have a high index of suspicion, you may want to CT this person in your emergency department. Of course, MRI is better, especially when you're thinking of ligamentous injuries, but you can save that for the outpatient setting and try to find those little occult ones with a CT. The other thing that I don't think of, probably because we don't see a lot of skiers in our setting, is a fracture of the lateral process of the talus, which usually happens with the inversion and dorsiflexion with the axial load. So that's something to think about as well. And you guessed it, Wendy. We're going to need a CT sometimes to see those injuries. <laughs> so one of the things that we talked about a lot, I remember in residency, because it was a very common multiple choice question of the difference between a Jones and a Suda Jones fracture and I keep forgetting which one is the good one, which one is the bad one. So the Jones fracture is the bad one, and that's the one that's a little more distal. So it's not proximal, it's in the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction, and that is the one that you have to be more aggressive in managing. The pseudo Jones is the one that's pretty proximal, so it's just kind of like a chippet of the base of the fifth metatarsal, and that one would do okay with a hard sole shoe or a boot, and then progressive weight bearing. So it's not something that you need to treat so aggressively. So that was one of the really good reminders of the article as well. Another great reminder I thought was that we all used the Ottawa Ankle Rule to help us figure out who need a imaging for their foot or ankle pain. And certainly if people had pain at the base of the fifth metatarsal, then you would be concerned and you would get in plain film and find this Jones versus Pseudo Jones fracture. One thing that I thought was interesting was that we have to remember that the mechanism of the injury has to be to the ankle and foot region, not so much of direct trauma. So if somebody had a big metal box fell on their foot, that's not the time to think about whether or not <laughs> that you can spare them from a uh, playing film. That's a very good point. That was a great summary, Dania, in terms of the pearls when we're evaluating a foot injury. What I took away from your discussion as well as the article is that there are times where you can actually miss a radiographically occult injury by definition of this phrase, especially when you're worried about midfoot, Liz Frank type of injuries. So doing a good exam and having pain, if you have somebody who has pain in the midfoot, that's something to raise your suspicion for. In those cases, you have to remember that you might have to get a CT to actually find the injury because the management of this needs to be urgent. 
Yep, that's pretty much it. Well, Wendy, you were actually listening to me when I talked. <laughs> All right, so tell me about the article that you read. It seems like I always get the articles about drugs and neurological <laughs> symptoms. I think there's a, a... Are you trying to hint at something, Wendy? <laughs> so the other article in this particular issue was called Full Stop Withdrawal from Atypical Agents. And this was written by Dr. Amy Mishler, a PharmD, as well as Dr. Frank Levicchio, a toxicologist at Maricopa. This was a great issue in terms of talking about withdrawal definitely from drugs that we might not commonly think of in the ED. I know we all take care of alcohol withdrawal, opiate withdrawal, etc. But how many times have we taken care of a baclofen withdrawal or even venlafaxine withdrawal? That was a new one for me. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, wait, wait, let me Google that. Have I seen that before? So you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that once I thought about it, we see that a little more than we think we do. I agree. Especially, um, I think the article talks about clonidine withdrawal. Mm -hmm. We see that all the time, whether it's intentional withdrawal because they were abusing clonidine or they ran they out ran of the prescription. Mm -hmm. That's true. And one of the tough things with a lot of withdrawal syndromes is that nobody presents like the textbook, right? Mm -hmm. Unless we're talking about the classic withdrawal syndromes. With a lot of these medications, you're going to have nonspecific symptoms like agitation, tachycardia, fever, really masking as sepsis, anything else. And so we have to think of withdrawal again to be able to identify and treat it appropriately. So one of the first drugs that they mention is intrathecal baclofen that's commonly used for treatment of spasticity. And one thing that I definitely had a great refresher on is the fact that the reason these people have intrathecal baclofen is because oral baclofen just doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier well, and so they need actual CNS delivery of this medication for it to work, which makes sometimes treatment of baclofen withdrawal even tougher. Definitely. The signs and symptoms of baclofen withdrawal can really be quite significant, sometimes mimicking malignant hyperthermia or serotonin syndrome, or like we mentioned, sepsis. And these people can have seizures, and maybe we can even think about it in somebody who has maybe refractory seizures, if they fit the clinical picture of somebody who may have had something like a baclofen pump and stuff. Have you ever dealt with a baclofen pump before? Not with a withdrawal from a baclofen pump, but now that you're talking about it, I'm thinking like, I don't usually think of looking for a baclofen pump when somebody comes in with a refractory seizure, so that's definitely a really good take-home point. Because what I tend to think of is, oh, withdrawal, intractable seizures. If you're on the board exam, it's definitely INH <laughs> overdose, and they right. definitely need pyridoxin, or, you know, like hypoglycemia, or it's like a secret pregnancy, right. <laughs> and it's eclampsia. But I don't tend to think of it as baclofen. And that's definitely a great thing to remember. So I'm adding it to my list of provoked seizures. Another atypical agent they mentioned is venlafaxine, which I think we've all seen patients on this SNRI. And it's interesting because the most common withdrawal symptoms are very benign that you might think. Irritability, dizziness, fatigue, GI symptoms, or maybe these people are just presenting with anxiety and you tell them that they need to go see their psychiatrist for their medication. Yeah, and just as a reminder, I, I told you, I googled venlafaxine because I was like, wait, which one is it? And it's Effexor. So for people out there who are into trade names, first of all, that's bad. Don't be like me. You need to know the generic <laughs> names. Be like Wendy. Don't be like me. But it is Effexor. To put it into perspective, this lesson includes a case of a 29-year-old female who presented with headache, fatigue, dizziness, restlessness, and a sudden increase in depression. And she has a long history of depression and has been taking venlafaxine for the past four years, but recently stopped taking her medication because she was feeling much better. Which sounds very typical of a lot of our patients. You feel better, you stop. Take. Exactly, yes. Which is not a good idea, apparently. No, no, that is not recommended. And in her case, she stopped her medication 48 hours ago and she started having these symptoms. Okay, so that's the that's timeline we're looking at, Wendy, a couple of days after stopping the medications? Yeah. Okay. So how are we supposed to treat that? So you can treat this actually with uh, SSRIs, which was something that was new to me. I would have thought that restarting the venlafaxine would be the easiest thing to do, but we have to consider why did the patient stop the medication in the first place. If it was because of some other sort of adverse drug reactions, restarting the medication really doesn't solve that problem. The article suggests using sertraline or fluoxetine as a um, medications to treat the symptoms just by replacing the serotonin really helps. 
Okay, and sertraline is Zoloft. I just Googled it right now. <laughs> and fluoxetine? Hold on, hold on, Google. Prozac. Again, all medications I think we've seen on a patient's medication list before. And then finally, clonidine, another medication that we often see in the ED. And as you mentioned, Anya, sometimes these might not be intentional withdrawal symptoms that our patients can present with. Yeah, I mean, patients run out of their medications, there are weekends, there are holidays. There's a lot of technical glitches in getting prescriptions called in. It always blows my mind how people's medications are for 30 days only, but then they can't get it anymore until they see their doctor in 40 days. It just blows my mind of what are you supposed to do in these 10 days? And I don't know, I guess it's not that big of a deal when your blood pressure medicine is HCTZ or hydrochlorothiazide, but clonidine? We all know that it's definitely not our favorite medication to put people on. Well, see, it's not our favorite medications, but I'm pretty sure there are people out there who love clonidine because there is no other explanation for the number of patients that I see that are on clonidine. And I personally think that clonidine is an awful drug just because I've seen people in withdrawals. I'm sure you have. Right. I agree. One thing that I learned from this article is that when people have been on high doses and for a long time, even if they're just trying to make their medications last and they cut it down to, let's say, 0.1 milligrams per day, they can still have withdrawal symptoms. This is crazy. Oh, wow. So it's not, you, ha- you don't have to completely stop your quantity. You just have to decrease the dose so drastically. Right. Yeah. All right. Take home point number one for me from, from this is... Do not ever prescribe clonidine for people unless you know that they are not going to miss any doses whatsoever. So what are some symptoms of clonidine withdrawal? Patients would come in and they're a little jittery, they're tachycardic, they're really hypertensive, and it's pretty difficult to control. And I think that that's the one we tend to see more often, is, or the ones that I tend to see more often. This patient comes in for an ankle sprain or ankle pain or something that's completely not related, but you've learned about it in the previous lesson today. <laughs> um, and then you notice that their blood pressure is, I don't know, 220 over 140. And when you start asking them about that, and you're like, okay, well, this is not just pain. Turns out that, you know what, they missed their clonidine for a couple of days because they ran out, they moved, it got stolen, or one of the slew of reasons that people would run out of their clonidine. And then you you say, oh, okay, great, let me try to control your blood pressure a little bit, and it just does not happen. And in severe cases, people can even have an MI, you know, or stroke, or VTAC from the significant effects of this withdrawal. Oh, wow, that's awful. So what are we supposed to do with that, Wendy? I mean... What I do is I always sit there with this like ethical, emotional dilemma where I'm like, okay, well, clearly I don't like clonidine. You clearly cannot take your medications the way you're supposed to for various reasons. And if I restart you on clonidine, I'm kind of starting that cycle again. Right. But if I don't give you clonidine, how can I get your blood pressure under control? Because part of it is when you're hypertensive, so we need to address that. But the other part is that you're withdrawing from that clonidine. So what would you do? So the treatment of clonidine withdrawal can be just like you mentioned, if you are for clonidine, just restarting the patient on clonidine. Otherwise, it's actually a little bit complicated because you have to think about how to target all the effects of clonidine. You can essentially substitute another alpha blocker using prazosin, and then you have to think about some sort of beta blockade too, maybe a tenolol, maybe even there are some, I guess, reports of using propranolol. And what was interesting is that you can also add some benzos. Huh, okay. So which benzo would you use? Like something longer acting like Calibrium or Chlorodiazepoxide or would you use something a little shorter? Yeah, I think the Chlorodiazepoxide is a great choice for this. All right, well, that's interesting. So here is what I'm hearing you say, Wendy. Sometimes patients come in and they run out of their medications, whether they were prescribed or abusing those medications. Intrathecal baclofen, which is very difficult to abuse. I'm just guessing that that's prescribed. <laughs> yes. um, but then things like effects or clonidine, and that when patients are running out of their medications, that's something I should take very seriously because when it can be extremely uncomfortable. But for baclofen, people seize and die. Yeah. And for clonidine, they can have extreme hypertension that may or may not lead to a hypertensive emergency. And those can be challenging to address. And one definite practice changing thing from this article is that maybe the next time a patient who's on venoflaxine who comes to the ED and needs a refill, I will actually refill that medication for them. Well, that sounds like a great one. For me, now I know how to get out of or at least consider not having to refill the quantity for a person if I do not think that that's a good fit for them and kind of go around that by giving them prazosin, a beta blocker, and consider Librium or chlorodiazepoxide for their symptoms. 
Well, that was a great review of the two lessons from the major articles from this issue. Another great pearl that you guys should definitely look into is the critical procedure section, which this issue highlights the placement of a suprapubic catheter. Which, I mean, when was the last time you put in a suprapubic catheter by yourself, Wendy? Uh, I would say never. All right. I change see? one, but yes, not a placement <laughs> of one. All right. So see, that's the great thing for us to review because, again, when you're working in a community hospital, your urologist is not going to come in at 2 in the morning to do that. And it is kind of embarrassing to transfer a patient out for a procedure that you should know how to do, especially now that we have ultrasound. So definitely take a peek at that part of the article or the issue this month. Well, thank you guys for taking the time to listen to us discussing this issue. We talked about foot injuries. We talked about withdrawal from atypical drugs. And we can't wait to do this again for the next issue. If you have any cool cases or any questions or any great pearls to share with us, don't forget that you can always contact us on Twitter. My handle is very boring. It's at Dania Kojo, which is my name. And mine is at EM underscore NCC for EM Neurocritical Care. And we look forward to hearing from you guys. And until next month, take care.